The next one up on this list, we take a look at yet another Psygnosis game. This time, it's based loosely on a novel from a former long-running series of books written by the deceased Terry Pratchett, and also marks the first US game for the system that is a point-and-click adventure. And that's game number 25, Terry Pratchett's Discworld. Based loosely on the 8th novel and the second North American game to utilize the PlayStation Mouse. Published by Psygnosis and developed by Perfect Tan Productions and Teeny Weeny Games. The story, and also little parts of the novel, takes place in a fictional city state called Ankh Morpork, inspired by the locations of Tallinn in Estonia, where a secret brotherhood summons a dragon from its native dimension so it could cause destruction and mayhem across the city. Meanwhile, many people in the Unseen University, home to the many powerful wizards, are hearing rumors of the dragon and its rampage across the city. So the Arch-Chancellor wishes the involvement of at least one wizard to solve the rumor. And that wizard he picks is Rincewind, an average wizard with wise crack puns, who is our main protagonist of the game. And with him is his walking luggage who follows him around as his pet, who is tasked to find the dragon to see if the rumors are true. Rincewind eventually finds the dragon and a bunch of treasure, which he takes by the way. The dragon, which is a female dragon, tells Rincewind that she's under control by the Brotherhood and tells him to stop them or else she'll roast Rincewind alive. Now it's up to you to stop the evil Brotherhood and save the city before the dragon rampages the entire city and burn you down to the crisp. Our development history begins with the very late Terry Pratchett. Born and raised in Beaconsfield in England, he had a speech impediment since he was a child and was bothered by the head teachers in his school, but was very talented and always writes stories about fantasies, since he always had a love spot for fantasy with a bit of humor to it as well during his school life. When he eventually graduated from Wickham Technical High School and even earned his 5-0 levels and started A-level courses in Art, English, and History, he then soon starts his initial career as a journalism in 1965, though his work didn't blast off until in 1968 when Pratchett interviewed Peter Bender Van Duren, co-director of a small publishing company, Colin Smith Limited. When Pratchett mentioned he had written a manuscript which made Peter Bender Van Duren curious and told Pratchett if they could publish his book once it was finished. He ultimately accepted the offer, and thus his first book called The Carpet People was released in 1971, though it did not gain any attention until its rewritten version in 1992. Pratchett did continue to write and release his books, with all the themes being comic fantasy and British humor. He soon got attention when he released his first ever installment of the Discworld series, The Color of Magic, released and published in November 24th, 1983. Safe to say, it was well received in the UK. Due to having some mix of fantasy and comedy, and Pratchett has described it as an attempt to do for the classical fantasy universe what Blazing Saddles did for the westerns. After that, he then released more and more books from the Discworld series, and it kept growing with each passing book, until all the way up to the final book called The Shepherd's Crown in August 27, 2015. In total, there were 41 main novels with 6 short stories centering around the Discworld universe. With the novel series becoming big in the UK, there were many things that were involved around the Discworld novel series. Like toys, board games, TV shows, both live and animated, films, again live and animated, and of course, video games. The first game they attempted in the video game market was The Color of Magic, 
based on the first novel in 1986 for the Z Spectrum, Amstrad CPC, and Commodore 64, by the publisher Piranha Games and developer Delta 4. Yes, that Delta 4, who would later go on and make the abysmal The Town With No Name in 1992. The game had some decent to good reviews and praise for keeping the original source materials from the book, but wasn't a major success due to its poor marketing, according to Terry Pratchett, who was pleased with the 1986 interactive fiction game. Then, there was Discworld MUD, which stands for Multi-User Dimension, in 1992 for cross-platform software, which is a text-based online role-playing game, which also had some decent and good reviews, and was selected as the MUD Connectors MUD of the Month in April 1999 and was even second of the top three MUDs in the MMO Supplement and Issue 7 in Total PC Gaming UK Edition. However, nothing compares to Discworld's next game, and that would be Terry Pratchett's Discworld. But first, Pratchett wanted to find a gaming company that cared about the property, since the one who made The Color of Magic did not care about the property. Originally, a video game publisher, Adventuresoft, wanted to ask Pratchett to offer the rights to his property, since they were working on a game that was technically inspired by his books. Unfortunately, Pratchett declined the offer and Adventuresoft did not gain the rights to that property. But they still kept some inspirations from the book and was later renamed to Simon the Sorcerer released in 1993, and even spawned two more sequels after that. Pratchett had no luck of finding a company that cared about his property, and was almost about to call it quits in the video game industry. Until one day, when a creative director and designer, Greg Barnett, sought out the Discworld license. He intended to show Pratchett that he cared about Discworld, rather than seeking money. Barnett stated in an interview that Pratchett was more invested in how the intellectual property would be treated than money. During negotiations, he offered to design the game before signing a deal. He did so, and Pratchett agreed. Greg stated that the design showed respect for Discworld, and that was what persuaded Pratchett. This took roughly six months, and Pratchett was impressed with a demonstration of Rincewind using a broom to get the luggage off the top of a wardrobe. One of the two development studios, Perfect Ten Productions, developed an engine which was developed in a separate location to keep the code clean. The dialogue was refined by Pratchett. The character design was based on Barnett giving his interpretation of characters to a character designer who had worked for Disney. He stated that they went a bit slapstick on it. The backdrops were painted manually and digitized. Pratchett originally wanted the game to be based on The Color of Magic and for the team to work in succession through the series but Barnett believed that it would be detrimental and thought that it would be too difficult to make a game based on just one book. He also said in an interview that he was more interested in the Discworld itself than any particular book, and that this was so the story would be not restrictive to a narrative thereof. He explained that he wanted to license all of Discworld, which the novel series had 17 or 18 books during development from 1994 to 1995. So the team written an original story for the game, taking elements from various Discworld books, particularly the first novel, The Color of Magic, and the most plot element which they loosely based off of the 8th novel, Guards, Guards. Barnett stated that the team had effectively written a complete film script for the game. The game introduced a new character, a practicing psychiatrist known as the Psychiatricarists. What's a weird name of a character? Prochet initially objected to this, but later added his input, and the character became a retrophenologist. 
Barnett stated that he wanted to create Discworld as a flagship game for CD-based systems, and thought the Discworld license was 100% suited. The concept art and background layouts were produced by Nick Martinelli who, according to Barnett, was an excellent art director from the animation industry. These were illustrated and colored by a professional team. Barnett stated that he was intimately involved with the graphics in the concept stages and initial production, but later stepped back. The only thing left before the game was 100% is voice acting. Barnett stated that he wanted to improve the British comedy by hiring voice actors with British talent. Originally, he wanted John Cleese to do the voice for the main protagonist, Rincewind, but he rejected the offer saying that he did not do games. Dan Prochet wanted Nicholas Lindhurst to do the voice of Rincewind because he was physically based on his Rodney Charlton Trotter character from BBC's British sitcom Only Fools and Horses. But he also rejected the offer. Their third and final option was Eric Idle. Unlike the previous two who rejected the role, Idol agreed to do the voice of Rincewind and thus began recording. In order to act just like Rincewind from the novels, he was tweaked to make him more like Idol from Monty Python. Other voice actors include Tony Robinson's, Kate Robbins, who voiced every female character in the game, and John Pertwee. Barnett wanted someone to be the voice of death in the novels. Just like trying to find someone voicing Rincewind, he wanted Christopher Lee to do the voice of death, but was unable to afford him. Then he wanted Rowan Atkinson to do the voice of death, since Barnett believed that he would make a great death, but Atkinson also declined the offer. He then picked his third and final option, which was Rob Brydon. And same as before, he agreed to do the voice of Death and soon started to record his voice for Death and other characters too. Fun fact, while the other actors were record their voice for like a few days or weeks, Idol's recording had to be done in a day-long session in Los Angeles. Once the voice acting was completely done, and so is the rest of the game almost being completed, they needed to find a publisher to release their game, which they had a hard time for doing so. Originally, back in 1993, they had Sierra Online to be the publisher of the game, and was even officially announced on September 1993 that it would be released for home computers and home consoles the following year in Christmas 1994. But during its early development, Perfect 10 Productions and Teeny Weeny Games had troubles with Sierra Online, but also due to their engine, which they obtained and worked on, had some costs for another project, and ultimately cancelled all external development, and Sierra Online was out. Due to having no publisher, they had an advert in the computer trade weekly so gaming companies could attract interest of the game and would be the publisher for their game. The two publishers that attracted the most was Electronic Arts and Psygnosis. The latter approached Perfect 10 Productions and would not leave until a deal was signed. Psygnosis had offered Prachet a big check, which he refused, but still agreed to let Psygnosis to be the publisher of the game anyway. Though it may be odd why they picked Psygnosis for unknown reasons, but at the same time was a good thing they picked them. Because if they chose to agree with Electronic Arts to be the publisher of the game, then EA would have milked off the property to the core and kill off two development studios with one stone. So yeah, they were very lucky on that decision. 
Now with a new publisher and Discworld's engine being rewritten from scratch in mid-1994, they soon finished the game in early 1995 and was soon ready to be released for home computers like MS-DOS and Mac OS and home consoles like the Sega Saturn and to no one's surprise, Sony PlayStation in fall 1995. The game was released on both floppy disk and CD-ROM, with the CD version featuring a fully voiced cast of characters. For the Japanese PlayStation and Saturn releases, all voice acting was redone by a prominent Japanese comedian, a major selling point for the game in Japan. There were also other home consoles port that were planned, but were never released. For example, a port had been underway for the Philips CDI in 1996 and had entered its final stages of development but was never released due to the console's abysmal sales in the gaming market. A 3DO interactive multiplayer version was announced to be in development and slated to be published by Psygnosis during E3 1995, however, this port was never released for unknown reasons. A Sega CD version was also planned and even advertised, but like the 3DO, was never released for unknown reasons as well. And finally, recent discoveries in an April 2020 online interview, which happens to be the month that I started the whole series, shockingly, when a former Perfect 10 Productions and Teeny Weenie Games member, David Swan, stated that Atari Corporation approached the company in regard to a potential conversion of Discworld for the Atari Jaguar CD. However, no actual development started on the port beyond discussion phase, due to market issues and low install base of the platform. Also side note, the Saturn version had to be delayed for a year till 1996, and much like Destruction Derby, while Europe got it in August 15, 1996, and Japan in December 13, 1996, the North American version was cancelled because again, it was due to its struggles in the US market. Anyways, when the game was originally released for DOS and OS in Fall 95, it was a massive hit in Europe and the United Kingdom, according to director Greg Barnett. However, the game was less successful in the United States. It received generally positive reviews, the humor and graphics in particular were widely praised, but some thought that the difficulty was too harsh. It tied for third place in Computer Game Review's 1995 Adventure Game of the Year Award category. The editors noted its good voice work and very nice animation, and praised its humor. There were also other reviewers that made some general reviews. Like Computer Gaming World's Charlie Ardai praised the humor and believed the writing was true to Pratchett. PC Gamers reviewed praised the speech, believing it greatly improved the humor and also complimented the difficulty, saying the game cannot be completed within days. His criticisms included the overuse of dialogue in the first act, saying most of it is irrelevant to the story, and also that the control system falters in certain areas. He stated that Discworld is a worthy contender to Sam and Max, and challenged the hold LucasArts had on the point-and-click genre. David Tengay of Adventure Classic Gaming described Discworld as one of the funniest adventure games ever made, but recommended that players use a walkthrough. Which, spoiler alert, I did use a walkthrough guide in my first playthrough. Yeah, I know, I'm a cheater. But I'll explain it in the review gameplay segment later on. And Christopher Lindquist of PC Games, though criticized the graphics and animation as merely average, but he claimed that fans of Pratchett won't mind the game and described it as a smart, funny, and long gaming tribute to the series. 
So, with the home computer versions being a success, how will it do for home consoles? Especially the only home console port that we ever got in the US. Which is obviously the PlayStation version. Well, when the PlayStation version was released in Europe in October 22nd, 1995, North America in November 16th, 1995, and Japan in July 5th, 1996, like the home computer versions, it was a massive success in Europe and the United Kingdom, but was not successful in North America and the US for this version. I'm going to be focusing on the reviewers in the US, since the UK reviewers have done the same thing too. Anyways, as for the reviewers for the US version, Entertainment Weekly praised the voice acting of Eric Idle, but criticized the PlayStation version, saying that it was difficult to navigate without the PlayStation mouse, and that the text was too small. Electronic Gaming Monthly similarly commented that the PlayStation mouse is required for full enjoyment, but highly praised the voice acting, humor, and graphics. And finally, Scary Larry of GamePro, in contrast to EW and EGM, said the standard joypad works as well as the PlayStation mouse. He praised the humorous graphics, extents voice acting, and script which will leave you sights aching for laughter, but found the game too simplistic and lacking in challenge. He recommended it for players who were open to less serious gaming. And that's pretty much it for the PS1 version. And if any of you wanted to know the reviewers for the Saturn version, well, I'm going to mention it to you right now. When the Saturn version was released in 1996, it wasn't a massive success like the other predecessors before it, but was a decent hit. Like Sega Saturn Magazine cited overlong dialogues, poor graphics, and largely non-existent animation but complemented the variety of locations to visit and their medieval backdrops, and described the dialogue as jokey and sarcastic. The magazine's Japanese namesake agreed with this statement of British humor by describing it as ironic and amusing. And Mean Machines Sega's reviewers believed the Saturn version had lost some authenticity and thought that the gags were not funny, but complemented the storyline. Now with the reviewers for all the ports done and out of the way, let's dive right into this game and review it to see if it still holds up many years later. Here we go. The graphics are good and very well to look at, in most certain places. I do like the coloring of the 2D environments, like the light woods, the town at nighttime, the unseen universities, library room, and many more. And the character sprites are alright. Some of the physical gag sprites are well done animated, and can show off their personalities, at times, either in a movement or the characters talking. The only minor flaw is that sometimes when Rincewind moves, it has this little lag whenever he walks in a far distance, and some of the animation scenes tend to pause occasionally for like a split second. However, it doesn't affect the game. And of course, since point-and-click adventure games seems to have a hard time running on home consoles at the time, the presentation looks great. Like I said, some of the characters show off their personalities, and it's mostly done by the characters' dialogue. While most of them do spot on with their character counterparts, especially Brighton's performance as Def, which I'll play you some of the clips voicing Def. A bit slippery, is it? It's fine, I assure you. Maybe you'd better just spit on your hands. That's going to make it even slipperier, isn't it? It might be worth a try. Circumstances prevented it. Circumstances? What circumstances? It has something to do with butterflies flapping their wings. I don't quite understand it myself. 
but I do appear to have got 21 and some spare cards. Blast! You've cleaned me out. Let's go kill some butterflies. Get off. Leave me alone. Damnation if you don't clear out so help me, I'll... I'll... Oh, just bugger off. This all takes an effort, you know. I'm putting myself out just for you, when there are thousands of other things I could be doing. Do I see any gratitude? I don't think so. Want me to kill him for you? No. No point, really. Death? Have you got Mr. Bun the Baker? Not until his oven explodes next week. Oh, I see what you mean. Are you saying that this is my appointed time to die? Well, since you put it like that, no. But I thought, there he is. And I'm happening to be passing, you know. It's a kind of outreach policy. But nothing compares to Idol's performance as Wincewind, which he nailed his role in the game. Thanks to his snarky comments and jokey wisecracks. Here are a few examples. Surely, sir, dragons don't logically exist. Shut up! Dragons exist if you believe in them. And the average man in the street does believe. Or at least believes in them enough to give us big rewards if they think we've gotten rid of the thing. Do you follow me? Not really. What? Well, why? Well, you are wearing a dress. Look! It's not a dress, it's a wizard's robe. It looks like a dress. But it isn't. It's the costume of a very ancient and revered order of aesthetes. Oh, you you run a lot, do you? You'd be amazed. No! Go away! No ghosts! No ghosts! Relax, son. I'm a wizard. Let me buy you a drink. So, um, what's all this about ghosts then, old son? Why is the librarian a monkey? <laughs> Did you get the number of that donkey cot? He's not a... one of them. He's an orangutan. But it's the same thing. What if that someone weren't just anybody, but someone pretty special in an unusual or useful kind of way? What? Like a colleague? Oh. Actually, I was thinking of a wizard. Really? Well, it would still have to be a pretty special kind of wizard. Have you any idea how difficult it is to get through to see you? Not really. Funnily enough, I've never had cause to do it, you see. Well, I think it's appalling. Whatever happened to open government? Well, since you put it like that, the last ruler who tried it ended up extremely open. I still find it odd that a genuine wizard can hardly get in to see you. Overall, great performance. As for the inventory, they're mostly shown either if you click Rincewind or his walking luggage. Though Rincewind's inventory is small, like the limit amount being 4, while the luggage is massive with no limits of how much it carries. And finally, when you don't move Rincewind for like 2 minutes and 35 seconds, depending which location you're on, it then changes to Wincewind standing in front of the camera and keeps saying hello to you. Unless if you move your controller or mouse. This is a fine fourth wall breaking whenever I see it. The music is fine. It was composed by Mark Bandola and Rob Lord. Though not as recognized from other game composers, but are well known for their other works of games they composed, like Primal Rage, Glover, Fusion Frenzy, Eye Ninja, and the very first Just Cause game. So they had a decent track record on those games. As for the music they composed for this game, well, it has this fantasy and folkish tone, fitting to the novels. But for me, I personally don't like this type of music. But still, a fine soundtrack. And finally, the gameplay. Honestly, I have little to say about the game. The controls, either the controller or a PS mouse, works fine. 
though the mouse works perfectly fast, while the controller moves sluggishly slow. However, I do have one major problem with the mouse, and that's clicking multiple times. You see, whenever you want to talk to someone or picking an object, you have to click the left mouse twice. Unfortunately, I had a hard time doing so, and say like an hour and a half through the playthrough, I got tired with the mouse and plug in the controller. And for the most part, it was fine, since you have the main action button layouts, and press it only once when you talk to a character or picking up an item. But like I said before, moving your cursor is sluggish and slow, though you could change the speed by using the option manual, but still, its movement is very sluggish. If only there was one solution to this, which it hit me. What if I use both the mouse and controller at the same time? So I got a bit experimental. So I plug in the mouse in the first port, and then plug in the controller in the second port. And lastly, tested it out. And it works! Both ports actually worked with this game, meaning I could use both the mouse and controller at the same time, and even strange that I'm using my right hand for the mouse and my left hand for the action buttons on the controller, which feels remotely like playing a game on a computer, but with a controller instead of a keyboard. Very oddly specific and very coincident. But whatever, the layout works and highly recommended if you're playing a point and click games on the PS1, if there are ones that feature it. We'll just have to wait and get to those in the future. As for the difficulty of the game, it's mostly hard to try to find some of the items you need to progress in the game. And even missing one is just completely frustrating. So for beginners who are new to this genre, I highly recommend looking up on a walkthrough guide right about here in this site, which I'll send in the link down the description below. I know this may be cheating to some who are professionals at the point and click games, but for me, I had a hard time and difficult time playing this. And really, I had no choice to look up a walkthrough guide, since I haven't played a point and click game in my life. Aside from most of the games by Humongous Entertainment that I played back in my elementary school years, of course. The most notable one I could think of is the first Pajama Sam game. But that's really much it for my experience for point and click games. However, I still managed to enjoy the game for the most parts. And found the dialogues entertaining once you get to that location. And don't forget finding easter eggs in the game, like every single point and click game ever made. Anyways, that's about wraps this up for this review. I'm not going to spoil the ending, the only thing I will mention that there is a twist to this story. But that's all the information I'm telling you in this video. So you have to play it for yourself to see what happens. Either a home copy or a computer copy or just emulating it. Now, on with the conclusion. The game is good and fine well done original story for the Discworld universe, with the graphics being accurate to the novel with some few lag problems, mostly some animation sprites, a well done presentation for the voice actors, a meh but still decent music, my words only, not yours. And the gameplay is good for the most parts, with some difficulty for beginners, but eventually get the hang of it. So, what happened after that? Well, after this one, there were two more games in the Discworld series, which are Discworld 2 Missing Presumed, or Discworld 2 Morality Bites, if you live in North America 
which serves as a sequel to the first game. Released for home computers in 1996, and later to home consoles a year later in 1997, which also managed to get a PlayStation port, which I'll soon come across in the future, and Discworld Noir in 1999, only for Windows and PlayStation. But unfortunately, both versions were never released in North America, due to the first two not being critical successes and not being popular in the United States, and was the final Discworld video game ever made as of 2021. What a shame. As for the creator, Terry Pratchett himself, he continued to make books, either original or part of the Discworld series. Sadly, disaster struck when Pratchett was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in August 2007, and announced it to the public in December 2007, though he was still active and alive, with continuing writing books, and even donated $1 million, which in Europe is 494,000 grand, to the Alzheimer's Research Trust. But sadly, his time was up. Terry Pratchett died at his home on the morning from the Alzheimer's disease in March 12, 2015, though the Telegraph reported an unidentified source as saying that despite his previous discussion of assisted suicide, but his death had been natural. After Pratchett's death, his assistant, Rob Wilkins, wrote from the official Terry Pratchett Twitter account, at last, Sir Terry, we must walk together. The final book of the Discworld series is, as I mentioned again, The Shepherd's Crown, released in August 27, 2015, five months after Pratchett's death. In early June 2015, one month before the final book's release, Pratchett's daughter, Rihanna Pratchett, who she is well known as an English video game writer in the video game industries, such as Heavenly Sword, Mirror's Edge, and the first two games in the Tomb Raider reboot trilogy, announced that The Shepherd's Crown would be the last Discworld novel, and that no further work, including unfinished work, would be published. While it's sad that the novel series was over, however, there's still some other related projects based on the Discworld property. Like the most recent ones are a live-action television series called The Watch, released back in January 3rd, 2021, which received mixed results. Like 50% Rotten Tomatoes mixed and an upcoming animated film called The Amazing Maurice, based on the 28th novel The Amazing Maurice and his educated rodents. This film is made by the production company Sky Cinema, with the film specifically targeted toward the young adult audience, and would be released on 2022. This comes to show that the Discworld property is still up and running with no stopping until the sun explodes. While it's sad that Prochet is no longer with us, but he'll always still be remembered of his Discworld series, which is of course the novels, the television shows, the films, the board games, the toys, and of course the video games especially 1995's Discworld game. While it may not be in the greats in the point-and-click genre, like The Secret of Monkey Island, The Neverhood, Sam and Max Hit the Road, and The Day of the Tentacle, but it's still in the category of good and most accurate to the novels, and overall, a fun time to play. I give my official rating a 4 out of 6. Hello to you all, this is CX, and I just wanted to tell you that there are now 25 of the 50 videos of the US 95 library done, meaning I have made it to the halfway mark, and will continue on with the remaining 25 games in the future, and hopefully complete the entirety 
of the U.S. library. Anyways, if you're wondering where's the part when I say next time and show a little hint of the next game, well, it's because I have two announcements to tell. First, my main series, The PlayStation Years, is going to be on a hiatus for now. Why? Well, that's the second one, and that is... Where is the complete history of the LEGO video games? Well, I decided to delay it to summer 2021. Due to online college work, as always, and also the fact that I did not have any time working on that said project. So yeah, I'm going to be more focused on that collab project with Rebellious Robot and also trying to find LEGO video games for our home consoles. Joy. Anyways, that is the announcement. And before I go, I want to mention that I'm going to be somewhat active on social platforms, which the only one that I'm ever going to use at the time in 2021 if I'll ever decide to open more social platforms, but focusing on this one is Discord, which the links are going to be down in the description below. If you also want to check out my partner, Rebellious Robot, I'll also send in the link down his YouTube channel. Granted, he hasn't made any amazing content yet but he will be very soon. And lastly, that I'm going to send a link to my list of every US retail PlayStation game ever released on my Excel docs, which shows the green check marks that I got and finished, and the ones that I haven't got and soon get it and check it off. This docs will get further updates by me, if I checkmark a game that I got. If you want to see my list and also how many US PS1 games there are by releases or years, then go ahead and check it out. Anyways, thanks for watching my series so far. And don't worry, this series will return once I finished on the collab project. And once that is done, then I will come back to it and history slash review the next game on this list, and that would be Doom. One of the greatest early first person shooters of all time, and got several home conversions, including this one, with some minor differences. If I made any mistakes or forgot to mention some things from 5 reviews I made from Jumping Flash all the way up to Terry Pratchett's Discworld, leave a comment down below. Thanks for watching.